two very large things that I think would impact your business. First of all, is climate change. Second one, artificial intelligence and general intelligence. The timelines are 2030. Okay. 2030, that's actually today. Right? So, climate change, we have all the solutions. We have the tech, we have the science, we don't have the politics. Right? I mean, we have to agree that we're actually going to do something. So now we're heading towards climate emergency. Rising temperatures, more storms, shortage of water, the species dying, you know, this is the place where we are going. And I think generally this is also 2030 because we have to solve a lot of those problems by 2030. I call this a total reset. Remember that movie with Schwarzenegger, Total Recall? Remember that movie? It's a great movie. I'm making a new film called Total Reset. I, I make one film a year. So, so I kind of look like, no, but I don't have the muscles like him, but I guess that's an advantage now when you get older. But anyway, total reset. Right? And whoever can lead people there first, that, that is the most important question. Mark Benioff, the CEO of Salesforce, says, our job is to get to the future ahead of our customers and be happy to greet them when they arrive. And our job is not to wait until the customer is asking us. It's to show the customer what is possible. Climate change is the first change enforcer. And how do humans change? You know that from your personal life, you only change with pain and with love, right? So you fall in love with a person, with an idea. In business, it's more like falling in love with a concept or, you know, new revenues. Or pain means, for example, you lose all your revenues, business dies. A German car industry, right? How did they change? With pain. So here's the pain, right? You see the climate development curve. You see what happened in the Industrial Revolution, the invention of the steam engine. And now we're going to invent our way out by saying invention of nuclear uh, fusion, invention of the renewable energy, and then we can get that curve to flatten again. Here we see what has happened in the past. We keep talking, we keep meeting. I go to those meetings the climate meetings, right? Nothing has happened in terms of flattening the curve. Right? I mean, it would probably be worse if we hadn't had those meetings, right? <laughs> but, I mean, this is a depressing curve where we see that it all goes up despite of all the meetings. Right? So now it needs to get more painful for that to happen. Now we have a real business. If you're going to invest in climate technology, any of these, now is the time. So, battery storage, position agriculture, climate fintech, the smart grid. I mean, this is where all the action is now, the next two to eight years. All the investors in the world are saying we're going to try to get out of oil. Of course, now there's a whole weapons discussion, a different story, and AI, but this is where they're putting their money. Like I said earlier, we have the science. We have the tech, we have the money, right? We're spending $6.8 trillion per year subsidizing gas prices. Can you imagine? $6.8 trillion. If we took that money and put it into green energy, it would probably be solved. But you know how it goes? This is a political question. It's not a practical question. So uh, this takes a lot of leadership to put into place. We see our biggest problem is this. If we are, the United States and, and Europe is decreasing in CO2, uh, but if we don't get China and everybody else aboard, we're still going to lose. So it's a very big geopolitical discussion. Europe and the US, if we go green, that's great. It will not change the world. We need Africa, Indonesia, China, everybody else. So this is a global undertaking. And I think we're going to get there, but it's a tough one. The second uh, really big change trigger is thinking machines. Cognitive computing, artificial intelligence. You see in that chart here that now machines are getting good at most of the things that humans are good at. Handwriting, speech recognition, image, reading comprehension, from pretty much nothing to almost 100%. Because you know by practical experience that Right now, there's no machine that's 100% good at 
reading or writing, but it's getting very close. What happens when the machine can read and speak and listen and write and research and reason? That could be very good for business because that'd be faster. But what's going to happen with our jobs? I mean, you see this curve here? This is the time that it takes a translator to translate what I'm saying in a different language. It's called TTE, time to edit. So now the machine is getting closer and closer and closer to being like a professional translator. So in two or three years, you will watch a movie on Netflix here and, and it'll be in English and you can say, I want it to be in, you know, Swahili. No problem. And just push a button. It'll be lip synced, not just subtitles. Right now, if you do subtitles, so what I'm saying right now, it would be a mess. But on Apple, if you dictate an email with the Apple app, that's 90% good, 99% good. I can dictate my emails. It works great. What it does to work makes us more efficient, powerful, fast, productive. These numbers, if we use, for example, generative AI, if you're a bookkeeper, you're two and a half times as efficient using AI. A lawyer, a little bit more efficient. But a paralegal, four and a half times as efficient. Office and admin support. I mean, imagine if you can only, for your staff, if you can get 5% more efficient and change everything. 5%. We're not talking about 2,000%. I mean, that is a mind blowing like Grid maintenance, IT, supply chain, smart machines, intelligent machines could make all the difference in terms of lowering the costs and bringing up the speed. And it's pretty amazing, all the stuff that's already happening there. Right now, we're only at the beginning because we don't know if we can trust what the machine does. That's a critical question. Yesterday was announced Microsoft's new AI is four times as good in uh, analyzing a patient than the doctor. Four times as good. If you give the machine all data and it reads your MRIs and your scans, it'd be four times as fast to make a diagnostic. It doesn't mean it's a doctor. It's just one piece of what the doctor does. <laughs> Now we have this curve, you know, people are saying, basically, if it goes on like it does right now, the power of AI doubles every three months, not two years. If you are 18 years old today, you don't Google anymore. You use ChatGPT on your phone. Answer all the questions. Where should I eat? Where's my girlfriend? You know, what do I do tonight? What's the right uh, Tinder profile for me? And whatever. Eventually, what happens is that humans are not going to be the number one inventor. Because the AI can look at your entire grid and can say, my analysis shows that here's the weak point. What are you going to do about it? Just like the doctor, and I witnessed this the other day. I was at the Mayo Clinic in America, and the doctor is operating, and the AI monitors all of the data, and it says to the doctor, your patient will die in 30 seconds if you don't do this. Because the, the AI is monitoring everything and comparing with statistical data. And the doctor said, I don't care what you say, it's my, shut it off, right? Nothing happened. AI was wrong. But, but this is, of course, a typical scenario. Now, we have to understand how that works when AI becomes smarter. You see all the research that goes into AI? You have to ask the question, is there any other research than AI today? Now we're reaching a sort of mind-boggling stage. That's where we are today, 24, 25. All of these changes, the millennials, the geopolitics, the technology disruption, that's going up the hill. And in 2050, we'll be here. Sustainable food, zero carbon energy, circular economics. Energy, I think, will be there before that. But this is the biggest paradigm shift in history. And we're right in the middle of it. And, and you will be leading that shift here in Greece. That, this is why we can't just look at energy. We have to look at transportation. Right? We have to look at the context. We have to look at economics. And yes, we have people like this, right? Who are doing the opposite. 
But, you know, we have a few people like this, internationally speaking, you know this will not work, right? No further comment, but... Okay, so when I talk about the good future, people are saying, oh, what do you mean the good future? Look at this guy. It's like, well, he's temporary. Right? The bad future is temporary. This huge paradigm is, is driven by the millennials, especially women. Right? Because now we have a different generation coming into power, roughly 25 to 45. That's the generation that is coming in right now. People my age are giving money and inheritance to the younger people, moving out of business. And so the younger people are coming in and they have a different paradigm of life. First, it doesn't matter so much what the economy does, only it's about climate. It's a huge shift, a mega shift. It's about green energy from carbon to clean. The culture is no longer boomer-centric, it's millennial-centric. And that was a little bit delayed because of COVID and then because of the war. But by 2030, the millennials are in power. Okay, roughly 25 to 40, maybe 45 even, that sort of time frame. Politics, government, business. You see, the trend on a global scale is more women, more younger people as executives in companies. I mean, it's still, of course, male-dominated, but until 2030, we're seeing a huge shift there. And we're seeing the shift towards digital work. You know, half of the new jobs will be digital. They will not be in person. And this whole paradigm shift of, you know, what we want, we don't just want profit and growth. We want people, planet, purpose, 